Hey everyone, welcome to the Training Friday edition of The Bullet. My name is Paul Lathrop. I'm the Deputy Director of New Media for the Second Amendment Foundation. Joining me today, as he does every Training Friday, Tom Walls of the Firearms Academy of Seattle. Tom, thanks for coming along for the ride today, man. Always a pleasure. Good to see you again, Paul. Yes, sir. You as well. Um, just curious, I, when, when I talked to Matt Mallory yesterday, he was suffering from a little bit of uh, Canadian smoke. Has that got to you folks on the West Coast? No, the, <laughs> not from that fire, no. The, the winds are going the other way. I, I have uh, a cousin that lives in, in Delaware, and they're, they're getting smacked pretty hard with it. But uh, here in the Pacific Northwest, we'll we'll probably generate our own wildfire smoke sometime this year. We have most every year since since we've lived in the county. Uh, it's been some bad ones, but knock wood, it rained today, so that might postpone things. Yeah, I, uh, well, hopefully, I and, and I, I gotta say to, to our friends on the East Coast, anywhere from. Pennsylvania East, my understanding is it's really bad, and uh, you stay indoors if you can. Stay, you know, you, you make sure the, the 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 filter on your furnace. If you've got central air, make sure the 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 filter in your furnace is working well. If not, make sure the filter in your air conditioner is working well. So, um, something that we do here in in the Northwest during fire season, and it gets bad. Take a filter and put it on the intake side of a box fan and just run it in your house. That will clean it up a bit. There you go. There you go. Sure. That See, folks, he does know more than just about training. He really does. I literally, I literally live in the middle of a forest. So forest he does. I've, I've been to Tom's house. We we cut fire breaks. <laughs> Brown, Brown Coat Manor is in the middle of a beautiful Pacific Northwest forest. Literally, I can, I can throw a rock and, and hit trees anywhere I throw a rock. And you could probably, I don't know, yeah, I don't know. You're you're probably a little. I know you're a little older than I am, but you may still be of the age where you remember what hacky sack is. I imagine you could hacky sack kick a rock, not throw, but you could hacky sack kick a rock and nail a tree from from your oh, house. Yeah. Oh yeah, we we live in in the old second growth. The original land was logged near as we can figure about. About the year 1900, give or take 20. Sure. We've got we we've had several trees taken down that are too big for local mills. Now. Yeah, and they they burned. Anyway. Anyway, let's let's go ahead. It's, it's supposed to be training Friday. We're supposed to be talking about firearms training. We've got we've got kind of two topics we're going to tackle today. Um. First one I want to get to, I'm going to take them in a little bit of reverse order on you, Tom. First one I want to get to is what do you need to consider before hosting a course? Tom, you are a trainer, and you've done some traveling with other trainers. Um, I imagine you've run across good hosts and, and okay hosts and hopefully not any really bad hosts, but... I haven't really done a lot of training with other hosts. I think I can remember one just in the last five or ten years um, that were excellent up in Alaska that hosted Miss mm -hmm. They needed some, some people that could help run the range portion. It would be the range safety officers and coaches. And We'd never been to Alaska, so Todd and Tammy Smith up in Wasilla when they lived there had us up. What they did as good hosts, they, they made sure we had transportation you know, back and forth from the airport because we weren't driving up there. We had a place to stay. They made sure we were fed uh, and took care of us. And then uh, for our part, we worked hard on the range for them. But not having to, to worry about that. Um, they said what they, they used to work, they used to do Amway, and they learned a lot about hosting people from that. But having everything there, not having to worry about the host going, oh, I should probably buy targets tonight, <laughs> Friday night before the class starts, and it's, you know, it's 8 o'clock at night. Uh, a host being organized, thinking ahead about what needs will be, anticipate the needs, you know, have a plan in place just in case. Um, having never done it, I would like to think I'd be able to, but those things struck me as being really awesome. 
uh, the willingness to to go out of the way to make sure that we were taken care of. I I will say this: the logistics would be your side. Well, I've I've uh, I've hosted several classes. Uh, the last one, actually, coincidentally, was two years ago. This week was the last class I hosted. It was just after my stroke uh, and my my cardiac event. Um, I hosted Masada Yub two years ago, and memories have been coming up on Facebook, reminding me of it daily. Um, including what a fantastically wonderful time I had, and 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 I miss I miss hosting. I I'm not I'm not ready to go back to it. I don't think physically or mentally I'm a hundred percent there yet. Um, ah, but you are younger than I am, so there is always hope. Yeah. Um, but w w one thing I will say, and I, uh, if you would like to get national level training, if you would like to get training from Masada Yub, from uh, people like, well, I mean, Kathy Jackson used to do. Matter of fact, that's how I got my very first training was through Kathy Jackson. Uh, I had her come up. If you want to get training from a national level trainer, Get in touch with that trainer. They don't have agents. They'll answer their own phones themselves. Trust me. Uh, all of them will. If they don't, call me and I'll get a word in for you. I know a lot of them. But, or call Tom. But yeah. you don't have his number. <laughs> anyway. Call, call the Firearms Academy. And, you know, what we do locally here in the Pacific Northwest, if there is demand for a trainer, uh, our director, Bill McCormick, will contact that trainer and see what their schedule looks like. It may take six months to a year to set up a class, depending on what that, that trainer is doing and where they are in the country, you know, if they're driving or flying. But that's that's how that happens. There has to be a demand. Well, and, and that's just where I'm going. If you, and say, if you singularly want to take the class, there's one. You need generally nine to 12 more. And then the trainer will come up and train everybody. Um, so all you need to do is sell the rest of the class. Uh, you need a course to have a, a place that's willing to, to open up, a range that's willing to open up and work with you and allow the class to take place there. Um, you need to, depending on the trainer, sometimes they will take care of the, the, the collecting the money and registering the students sometimes you'll be doing that um, the other thing but but do not get discouraged do not get discouraged if you want national if you want a big name trainer to come in and nobody's doing it because you can absolutely do it yourself get nine or ten of your friends around and say if I get X person to come in would you agree to take that course. That's really all it takes. Look at look at things on that instructor's website. Um, at this point in it, when you're planning, look at their cancellation policy. There are money that has to be spent up front, right, Paul? You've got to, if you're renting a facility, you've got to book the facility, the, the range, indoor or outdoor, whatever that might be. You have to provide for any insurance uh, that that range may require. You've got to realize that the instructor coming out has got airfare and lodging that has to be booked ahead and may or may not be refundable to them if the class cancels. If you cancel at the last minute, that's a spot that could have been sold to someone else if that class is full. And so, you're, going, you're going to be liable for a lot of that money. Well, and So look, uh, different, different schools have had different policies ask. It's a perfectly reasonable question. Uh, if you have some sort of emergency circumstance, I'm sure they will work with you. You and I were just talking about one that I had last week. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't a it wasn't a, a firearm school. It was a driving school that we we had some things happen, like literally last minute. Uh, they'll work with you, but it's like yeah, I just didn't feel like coming. The weather was so nice, so I went with my friends to the beach. Uh, probably not. We we do keep track here at FAS of those folks that tend to do that a great deal. And we have to treat them differently because that's, like I say, that's money that could be coming in if they expect to be refunded. 
that we could have sold to someone else in a full class. And you're denying someone else, you know, another shooter that really wants that class and that same trainer that you obviously put value on by signing up for the class. Denies them that spot. It's just, it's damned inconsiderate, at the very least, just to not show. So if you're going to cancel, if you're going to no-show, know what, know what the financial penalty may, may be. You, know, you may be out a whole bunch of money and just have a whole bunch of extra ammo. One thing that Susan and I do when we host classes, and I, there may be other hosts that do this, but they're rare if they are. Uh, the particular range where we uh, take the, the people to go to classes to is miles and miles away from any place to get something to eat. And so we tell people, look, uh, if you're going to come take class with us, fantastic. We will provide lunch. And during, almost if it's an all-day course, every trainer, every reputable trainer will have a break where people can eat. And we will cater, we, we will cater in food to make sure that everybody has something to eat. The reason that happens is the very first class... I I hosted was a Kathy Jackson class. I didn't I didn't even think about that, and I noticed the people that didn't bring a lunch. By the end of the day, they were not as focused as they could be. And I figured, you know, if if they want to, if if I want them to get something out of this, if I want people to keep coming back to my training classes. We're going to provide at least a rudimentary lunch going forward. And we've done that. Matter of fact, the last Masada Yub group class we had, we, we catered both breakfast and lunch and one time dinner. So um, I would like to see people hosting have water available on the range, an outdoor range, an indoor range. I'm assuming they have some type of plumbing facility. The outdoor ranges, we have stacks and stacks of cases of water in our storeroom at FAS. And I know that uh, other schools do as well or have some way to make sure students stay hydrated, especially in the summertime. Even if you're not busting a sweat, you are breathing out and exhaling and you're becoming less and less hydrated. Big deal at Gunsight, they've even got charts in the, in the restrooms because they're a, a high-end facility with a lot of money behind them. And they actually have flush toilets and wells. And they have little charts to show what color your urine is when it's less and less hydrated and how much water to take on board. But making sure that your students stay hydrated, if nothing else, is a safety issue. One yes. of the first signs of dehydration uh, for older guys can be heart issues, lack of concentration, certainly. Same thing for making sure that your students understand what the food options are. Are you close enough to break and go to a subway down the street? Or, in your case and in our case, the nearest, the nearest food facilities are half an hour, 45 minutes away. So there's half an hour to an hour or more of drive time just for that and no eating time. You need to plan ahead. A good host will have that all scoped out. Absolutely. Um, let's change gears here we we covered this oh i suppose it's been a year ago about a year about but a year. i i want to you're going to go now let's let's take it the other way you've decided that there masada yub is coming he's going to be near me i'm gonna finally go take this course i've heard about it i've heard paul <clears throat> and tom speak well about him i'm gonna go take this course do you need do you need to be able to shoot a 300 what uh, do you need to go out practice beforehand? What uh, what do you need to do, Tom? The most important thing is to make sure you're you're ready to go. It's it's not dissimilar to saying I'll join a gym, but first I need to get in shape, which is kind of why you would join the gym in the. So you don't need to practice. I would if you have current skills, I would review them. But realize that there is more than one way to do some things in the firearm world, and some of them are equally valid. You're not spending a considerable amount of money and time and effort to go and take the same class, at least not accidentally. You're, you're there to learn something different, so keep your mind open. Don't be that guy. It's, 
and we've we've had them. Every instructor knows them, and they are called that guy. That guy. So I said, well, the way that we do it at, or we did it over at, immediately puts people off, and he's the guy that's not going to learn anything. The kiss of death, if you're a student, is if the instructor comes over and says, hey, having a good time? Great, and then walks off. That means the instructor or the coach figures, okay, this dude's not egregiously dangerous. I'll keep an eye on him, but his ears are closed. I'm going to take my time and put it over to these ears. So please go in like the Zen story. Go with an empty cup to be filled when you get there. You chose the trainer. You chose to go to that class because they had something you wanted. Be open to it. Second thing, and I always tell my students this, we're going to be teaching you some stuff that you've never seen before, and it's going to be a new skill, and it's going to be difficult for you because it may be something entirely different, or your motor skills are practiced to do something one way, and we're telling you to do it differently. We're not necessarily saying what you already do is wrong. So leave your ego at home. What we're saying is give it a fair trial to get past that initial learning phase, which will take a day, maybe training day two before it starts to click. Give it a fair shot. You may find that it helps you. That's great. That's what you went and spent your time and paid your money for. You may find that it doesn't help you, but you could see where it would be of value for other people. That's a big thing that I look for when I go to other training, other training schools, other trainers. Um, not only to learn stuff for myself, but how can I pass that on? If you're an instructor going to somebody else's school, keep your mouth shut and your ears open. Look for how they teach. Take concepts. Talk to them confidentially. I notice, sir, that you do this extremely well. I, I, I train people too, so you're not like going there and poaching their ideas. But be a friend. Say, I teach too. How do you approach this? How do you do it? Most trainers. In fact, all the trainers I've ever met are very open about sharing their teaching philosophy um, to, to marry into your own teaching philosophy and to raise that level. But don't be that guy that knows everything and he's going to show stuff. I will tell you as a trainer, I do not remember the average student's name after a few months. I'll remember the exceptionally good ones, and I'll remember the really bad ones. Don't be that guy. From the classes I've hosted, one man sticks out in specifics in specific because I thought he was gonna be the I thought he was gonna be that guy, however, and I thought he was gonna be a real issue. However, it turned out that he was exactly the opposite. He got a ton out of the first class I hosted and has come back to several uh, courses after that for different trainers and uh, I, I he I'm not getting about I'm not getting about much in specifics other than to say the man is a physician in my local area I don't want to identify him any more specifically than that but um, he I, I had thought he was, you know, wow, this person's really, really knowledgeable, really quick, really, and, and, and yeah, it, uh, that trainer, Kathy Jackson, had a very short conversation with him at lunch, and totally different person the, the rest of the time, so, uh, absolutely have seen it go both ways. The one that sticks in my mind as one of the best examples of a good student that I ever had. I've had, I've had a bunch, but this guy stands out for some reason. He's the guy I try to be when I'm a student in somebody else's class. I don't want to go, yeah, I'm an instructor. If you need some help, just call on me. That's just arrogant and extremely out of place. I think of how I would feel if that someone came up and, and does that to me because I don't know them at all. This gentleman was just about my age. And he was very quiet, almost mousy looking, but I'm looking at his gear. He's wearing 511 pants and they didn't have the folds for the package. They'd been used and, and laundered and maintained. He's got a first generation Glock 17. Okay, if you know anything about, about Glocks, when you hear first generation Glock 17, that immediately evokes some type of law enforcement in your head. 
His gear was in excellent repair. It was minimal. It was quality. And he used it very efficiently. He's very quiet. When he asked questions, they were not the kind of question that you ask to show how smart you are. One of my, one of my great faults, I want to show people how clever I am by asking clever questions. His questions were direct, to the point, and he would take what little coaching he really needed. So I went up to him at break because I needed to find out more. And I said, sir, who are you? Not what's your name. I knew his name. Who are you? And he smiled because he knew exactly what I was asking. And in a quiet voice, I, he said, I'm a retired federal air marshal. His job was to sit in the cockpit and to kill the people that came in that weren't supposed to come into the cockpit. One of the most extraordinary examples of a good student that I ever had, he was there to learn. Um, for himself and just as a retired, uh, I assume he was retired, um, federal employee for security, uh, he was he was a gentleman. I've seen that also with law enforcement folks. They're there to do their stuff because when they come to us, they're on their own dime. It's rare that the department will. Those are the folks that I try to emulate. Those are the folks I love to see in class. If I see them doing something different, I'll ask them about what they're doing, and then I up my game as an instructor right. and as a shoot. But the first thing coming in is attitude. We can talk about gear in a minute, but attitude is critical coming in. Don't be that guy. Come in with an empty cup. And at the end of that class or school, if that technique that the instructor is teaching in your mind is still total BS, understand and be able to articulate why it's a bad technique, because that will still improve your understanding of of the of the art and science of, of shooting yes absolutely let's matter of fact speaking of gear we've got a comment here i want to get to uh roderick well, uh, says uh, by the way I, I was able to actually met roderick at the last grpc we had in dallas roderick says i really like my j-frame 357 i shoot it a lot in my opinion our most trainers focused on magazine handguns. Uh, I'd say that's the most. It's the most common uh, firearm <laughs> in training. I don't know if the instructors are focused there, but I know it's the most common gun for students. The answer, Roderick. The answer is yes, because that's what the market is telling us that people want. However, when my wife and I teach, we also both shoot revolvers. We stick a revolver in the truck in case a student shows up and we can demonstrate with that. And when we stick it in the truck, we've got the whole kit, we've got the holsters and the speed loaders and speed strips to demonstrate that. But we're not seeing it as much. Some of the beginning classes we'll see, uh, unfortunately, the, the pimply face kid in the gun shop saying, here little lady, this little, little revolver is perfect for your purse. And of course we want to go to the store and tune the guy up. But there are schools that will have revolver only classes. I went to a Revolver 350 at Gunsight, which is their semi-auto 350 class, the intermediate class, with revolvers. And that was, no pun intended, a blast because it was revolver centric. Those are few and far between, but if you really want to have fun, go do that. Because you get old guys like me or older, usually law enforcement, that grew up with wheel guns and you can learn some neat stuff. Uh, I'll say this about wheel guns. I, the very first certification I got as a trainer was Kathy Jackson's Cornered Cat. Uh, I, I am, I, I'm, I'm a certified trainer through Kathy. Um, in order to get through that qualification as a trainer, I had to shoot right-handed only semi-automatic semi-automatic, left-handed only semi-automatic, right-handed only revolver, and left-handed only revolver. And I'll say this, revolvers are absolutely perfect for left-handers. Oh They're God. actually faster for left-handers than they are for right-handed people. When my two-year apprenticeship for, for FAS as an instructor, part of it was to shoot our basic two-day uh, defensive handgun class with a revolver just because we need to see what we need to teach our students like like Tom Selleck has said in, in Quigley Down Under said I didn't have much use for him never said I didn't know how to use 
Well, before, I'm looking at our time, and this time is going really very quickly. I would yep. like to talk a little bit about other stuff I'd like to see students do. Come here. Do it. You will have available to you, either sent to you or available on the instructor's website, a gear list. Please pay attention to the gear list. That causes headaches beyond measure when you don't to the instructor and to the rest of the class. If they give a round count, if they say bring sunscreen, whatever they do, please bring it. Don't, don't try to edit it in your head. Those things are there for a reason. They're there from the instructor's experience. When you are going over your gear before you pack your range bag, please maintenance everything. All of these things I'm about to mention are to make your time more pleasant because there's nothing more frustrating than a gear failure in the middle of a once-in-a-lifetime very expensive class. It's also disrespectful to the instructor because they've got to modify their class and every one of your classmates that's going while well, you're getting your crap together. So look at your belt. They usually don't give out holsters, however, especially Kydex holsters. Check the screws. Check your tensioning. Use some thread locker. Loctite, and by the way, use the blue because you can remove it. Red Loctite, you may as well weld the thing. Check all that stuff. Have spare screws. Better still, have spare gear. Every time I go to a class, even when I'm teaching, I take spare everything, which includes spare holster. Make sure I've got the uh, correct number of magazines. If they say you need two, three, six magazines, have at least that many. That makes time go quickly. If they say preload your magazines, Please do that because everybody else will be going mm -hmm. for your magazines. If they don't say that, it's okay to preload a few. Keep one empty in case they want to do some, some manipulations or something that require an empty magazine. And I'll tell you, if you've got them preloaded and they say, but I only want 10 rounds per mag, it's a lot easier to drop those out yep. real quick and you're going to look like a pro. Think. Think ahead. Go through that class in your mind to think, what gear will I need? Have spares. Make sure your gun is maintenanced. If you have a gun that, that has uh, springs in it, especially the recoil spring, why don't you put a fresh one in before rather than being a cheap bastard and waiting until the thing gives out in the middle of class? Put a well, fresh and in. You, I, one would hope it would fail in class, not when the darn thing is really, 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 really needed. So if it's getting close to time, do it. I will, when I buy a new gun, I will typically, if it's a new model I'm not familiar with, I'll let it fail the first time. So I have a rough idea. But with, say, my 1911s, I know when they're going to fail. If, if nothing else, take the spring out from your gun, compare it to a fresh one. Oh, you don't keep spring. Fresh springs in your in your gear kit on your work table. Fix that stuff. Wolf gun springs are the gold standard. Check a used one compared to a new one, and if you find that the used one is a little longer by a coil or more, change it proactively. Same thing goes to batteries. Don't be a cheap sob. Now I'll wait till the batteries are gone because they're expensive. Not as expensive as as missing time in a class. Training time is precious. We never, any of us, get enough of it, especially if we're paying for it literally by the hour. So have everything fresh. Springs, batteries, go over your gun. Make sure it's clean and lubed. Um, if I've got a five-day class, I will clean mine daily. It doesn't need to be cleaned daily. But I do that to keep ahead of it so it doesn't accumulate crud. And I'll give it up. If, if I'm doing a five-day class, I'll wipe it down every day. I won't take it down to every pin. But I'll disassemble it, wipe it down if it needs to be ruled, get the crud so the crud doesn't accumulate and crap out on training day four, and then I've got a crap out done. And then if you do, have the spare. Tom, we are right down at the end of our time today. Before we go, wow. as I always do, what's coming up at FAS? What's uh, Are there any openings in the very near future? What you got that you want to plug? I don't have the opening schedule. Um, I'm always going to fudge and say go to the website, www.firearmsacademy.com. Um, talk to Bill, Bill McCormick, our director, and also runs all that ops from the office. We have on the schedule, we have Miss Adiub coming in July. I don't know what the status is on that. I get the impression that there may be some spots left. That's the MAG-40 class. Folks, Mass is a great guy, but he's not going to be with us forever. 
you know, if you're not in the Pacific Northwest, look at his training schedule and see where he is around the country. We have um, Craig Douglas. We have Jared Rustin coming out. We have, oh my gosh, um, Steve Fisher's coming out. We have Dark Angel Medical coming out. And that's in addition to our regular classes. I'm teaching a handgun retention class all day tomorrow. My wife and I were the lead instructor on that. We have our, our usual rifle classes, etc. So look at your needs. If you're in the Pacific Northwest, certainly look us up. Uh, love to have you out here. It's an outdoor facility uh, in the nice, clean air so far. <laughs> Pacific Northwest with the trees. And okay. by the way, although we're the Firearms Academy of Seattle, we are actually outside of the toxic city of Seattle in uh, still free Lewis County. Well, I, and I will say this, having been to the Firearms Academy of Seattle, having actually been to Tom's house, but I've been to the Firearms Academy of Seattle, the wind is generally off the ocean, so unless they light the ocean on fire, it's going to be fairly decent air there. So uh, we are down at the time we have. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Podcast listeners, thank you for listening. Folks, do please come join me tomorrow evening, one hour later, at 7 p.m. Central Time for the weekend edition of The Bullet. Let me get to my calendar so I can tell you that tomorrow's team is going to be myself, Alex Uli, Brooke Cheney, and Mike Piwarski will be going over the events of the week. We did get, and I want to get this in as we go on our way out the door. I want to get this comment in early. Where is the late, latest Second Amendment court battle? Well, the, the, honestly, they're all across the nation. We've got active lawsuits in, the, off the top of my head, Washington State, Oregon, California, a couple, three of them. We've got uh, New York, New Jersey. we got at least two in New York, New Jersey, the, the, Illinois. They're all over the place. Um, we're going to be highlighting a lot of them tomorrow. Please do come join us. We'll talk about the politics and the policy of the Second Amendment, including a 29th Amendment. We'll talk about that tomorrow night. Come see us then. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.